changed the Zoom setting now so that you can't take yourselves off mute. So that's all done. All right, lovely. We'll let everybody in now. Hi everybody, thanks for your patience in the waiting room. Just waiting for one more person to come in. All right, let's get started. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I would like to begin by acknowledging three traditional owners of the land on which we tonight's speakers are currently broadcasting to you from. Um, I'm on Yagara land, Katerina is on Ghana land, and BJ is on Noongar Buja land. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to any elders who are joining us tonight or listening to this recording later on YouTube. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, as I said, I'm really pleased to be here with you all this evening for this discussion of hysteria with Katerina Bryant and BJ Silcox. Before I hand you over to Katerina and BJ, I'd just like to really quickly reiterate some of the info that you were sent um, in the email with your link to join tonight's event. So as you've noticed, you are all placed on mute and you'll remain so throughout the evening. Um, but Katerina is keen to answer your questions. Um, if you'd like to ask some, please send them to me via the chat box. I will then read them out along with your name later on in the evening. Um, I'll tr start sending those through as and when you think of them, um, and that will ensure that we can get through as many as possible in the time that we have. Um, if you can't see the chat box right now, it should be towards the lower left of your screen. Um, and if you still can't find it, then don't worry too much because I'm gonna be using it to post the link that you can use to purchase your copies of Hysteria through us at Avid Reader if you haven't already. So when I do that, it will pop up there and um, you'll be able to type your questions in and send them straight through, straight through to me um, that way. Um, and so I'd now like to introduce Katerina Bryant. Katerina is an Adelaide-based writer who was shortlisted for the 2019 The Lifted Brow and RMIT Nonfiction Lab Prize for Experimental Writing the 2018 Feminazi Memoir Prize and the 2016 Scribe Nonfiction Prize for Young Writers. In conversation with Katerina tonight is BJ Silcox. BJ is an Australian writer and reviewer whose literary criticism and cultural commentary regularly appears in national and international arts publications, including Australian Book Review, The Times Literary Supplement, The Guardian and The New York Times. BJ grew up in regional and remote Western Australia and came to a career in writing circuitously. Sorry, I can't say that. She has degrees in law, psychology, and fiction, and has worked as a criminologist and agony art, a strategic policy boffin, and creative writing instructor in rural Virginia and down rural Virginia and downtown Cairo. She joins us from her parents' shed in Albany, WA, where she has spent the year living out of a suitcase because of COVID border restrictions. So, BJ and Katerina, it is now my pleasure to hand over to you both for tonight's discussion. Thank you. Oh, it's so exciting to be here with this magnificent book. Uh, Katerina, I would just love to do a little intro first of my impression of the book. Um, so shopping for groceries one night, Katerina finds herself oddly removed from the world. Her body is in the fruit and veggie aisle, but her brain has been somehow pulled from itself. She's lost to herself. And it's the beginning of a new version of her life, not one that she had envisaged for herself or hoped for herself. It's a life of seizures and medical tests and slippery diagnosis and new limitations. A life in that other world that Susan Sontag calls the kingdom of the sick. And faced with so much uncertainty, Katerina tries to do what she always does, which is read her way to an answer. And what she discovers is that there is belonging to be found in this sense of unbelonging. Throughout modern medical history, women have been describing the same constellation of symptoms with force and clarity, that their lives have become buried underneath the doctors, the lofty medical men who had treated them. So in this beautiful book, Hysteria, Katerina gives these remarkable women the dignity of a story of their own. And in telling that story, finds a voice for herself. 
In a world where we speak about illness as weakness, as something that must be battled and fixed and vanquished, Katerina offers us the radical compassion of acceptance, the notion that to be ill is not to be broken, but to be differently whole. Now, I was asked to moderate tonight, not because I'm a literary critic, but because I'm a woman who has spent most of her life feeling indelibly broken, at war with my body. Um, when I just, well, well, my first experience of that was a, a migraine, an idiopathic migraine I had at age eight, whose pain was so all-consuming, so rending, that I thought I must be dying. Two of my grandparents had just died, and so I did what I knew how to do, which was sit at my desk and write a will in texter that I slipped under the door of my parents' bedroom during the night, which must have been awfully terrifying for them to read when they wake up the next morning. But it started a long life relationship with pain and chronic illness. And I have longed for a book like this one, a book that helped me say with certainty and ferocity, I am not imagining this, a book that made me feel less alone and kind to myself. And I know that I'm far from alone in this. So in writing this brilliant book, Katharina Bryant joins an esteemed literary company of writers that help us make sense of our most vulnerable and unsung selves, from Virginia Woolf and William Styron to Eula Bliss and Siri Husted and Sylvia Plath. Now, it's a magnificent achievement for any book, let alone a first book. So Katharina is a writer to watch. Welcome. It is so wonderful to have you come talk to us, Katharina. Thank you, BJ. What a wonderful uh, way to be introduced. I wish I could uh, bring you everywhere in my life. <laughs> oh, that's lovely of you to say. <laughs> now, we join you in this book at the very beginning of your journey with this illness. Could you start us off perhaps by reading that passage to just orient us to where we are in that journey? Yeah, of course. Um, so I'll just be reading a short section from the very beginning of the book. As I wheel the trolley into the supermarket, my partner, Matthew, already ahead of me picking out plums, my head begins to rush. I feel light, as if my bones have been taken out of me and I float along. Buoyant, I'm only flesh and blood. Matthew comes back, placing the crinkled bag in the trolley. You all right? I hadn't realised, but since the rush of air filling my mind, I haven't moved. I'm standing still, frozen, a metre or so from the entrance. The trolley is empty, bar the plums. I don't answer him. I'm caught where I'm standing. A stream of air pushes through my head. I haven't moved. Katie, a name only Matthew and my parents call me, I barely register his lips moving. I move my eyes away from the silver lines of the trolley and up to him. It's hot today and the warm weather has made his hair curl up into its natural rings. I can see the thickness of his brows behind his glasses. Mm, I mumble and try my best to nod. It comes out slow and measured as if I'm holding a conversation while reading. Matthew takes the trolley from my hands and pushes forward to scoop up mushrooms. I follow him with slow, short footsteps. My movements are a fraction of the speed of those around me. I'm immune to the urgency of Sunday late afternoon shopping. Matthew places the mushrooms in the trolley and I can just smell their earthy scent. I look at their duotones, brown and white. They are small curls stacked up in a tray. They remind me of snails and somewhere inside me I hear snails in the supermarket and a hint of a laugh. I follow Matthew, pinching the cotton of his t-shirt like a toddler would, moving towards the aisles. We walk past the fish, open mouthed and eyes gaping, and I feel curious alarm. Do they always look like this? I look at the women and men behind the counter. They wear rubber aprons with brown leather straps. One is talking to a middle-aged customer with thick red-rimmed glasses. The seafood line trickles out into our path and I struggle to move my body past the knot of people. 
I grip Matthew more tightly. He leads me away, pulling me into the safety of the aisles. I stand by the trolley as he runs up and down, filling it with our staples, tofu and pasta, canned tomatoes and cheap soy milk. I can feel his annoyance. I've left this all to him. I will myself to move, walking down the aisle and loosely pulling the trolley beside me. I make it to the cracker section. What do we need again? My eyes gloss over the brands as they usually do. They fixate on colorful packets and thick text. It's beautiful. The bright mix of cardboard reminds me of driving up to Lobethal to see the Christmas lights with Yaya. The cardboard shimmers under the gleam of fluorescent lights. When we reach the checkout, I start to become myself again. As I come to, I can hear the music, Christmas carols playing in heavy loops. I ask Matthew, have they always been playing? He looks at me confounded. He continues stacking the conveyor belt. I pay and carry three out of the five bags back to the car, an act of penance. When we settle into the warmth of the car, I begin to speak. Short, choppy sentences come out. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. It was too much. My spindly hands grip my knees. Matthew reaches out to them. I notice the line of hair on his forearm creeping up to his hands. It's okay, he says, let's go home. This is just the beginning. I think this is what it's like to go mad. Illness, Susan Sontag writes in the opening pages of Illness as Metaphor, is the night side of life. Everyone who is born holds a dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. Running my experience of childhood through my mind, I'm not sure if I've ever lived in the kingdom of the well. Compulsions lace the daily drives to school, which arch around the city from Lower Mitcham to North Adelaide. My compulsive counting would distract me from the aggressively cheerful 1960s British pop dad would play over and over. But this feels like something stronger, like a cloak taking me out of the world, at first small gaps and then swallowing hours in gulps. In the beginning, I did not recognise my own street, a leafy lane in Adelaide CBD. Not only was I taken outside of myself, but outside of my home too. The penguin crime paperback green of my fence was not mine. My hands and forearms did not resemble my own either. I would drift in and out of living with no sense of place or self to tie me down. I wrote this off as an almost dream. It always happened while I was alone, and so I doubted that it would stick until, that is, it all became much worse. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you. Um, that gives us a sense, really, of how incredibly evocative this book is about writing about illness. And I really want to focus tonight on the, the sheer literary achievement that this book is. But before we get there, we join you in this book at the beginning of your sort of diagnostic journey. Where do we find you now? So it was actually quite interesting because as I was reading that and I'm not in the habit of often going back and reading my own work, I realised that that scene in the supermarket took place almost exactly two years ago now that it's Christmas. So that was maybe three. Anyway, that was at a time when I was starting to encounter the diagnostic process and go through a series of tests and visits with specialists, which eventually culminated in the diagnosis of non-epileptic seizures, which is an interesting diagnosis in that it exists in between neurology and psychiatry. It's one that could be either or, but we simply don't know enough about the brain. And as a result of that, but I think really for many people 
living with chronic illness. It's less about the diagnosis and more about the individual ways to manage illness that work for that person. So the book sees this search for answers and this really voracious wish that a diagnosis provides a solution and that was not and is not the case. And so I think the book cured me of the idea of illness being linear and a narrative that ends and is something instead that is embodied and something to be lived with in a lot of ways comfortably alongside an otherwise normal existence. I think that's the what's so powerful about the book and its message, sort of radical acceptance. When you start writing this, one of the things that strikes me is that illness takes us to the edge of what language can do for us. And that's what's so, in a sense, terrifying about illness is trying to explain to others the inexplicable when we can't even understand the experience ourselves. Now, what's remarkable about your book is that you manage both to describe what's happening to you with a kind of technicolour specificity, but also capture that unknowability of it. When did you first start sort of taking notes about what was happening to you? And when did they become to you a kind of literary object rather than a personal object? So every scene within the book is not written from long-term memory, I'll say it was written from immediate memory because it's all memory. Um, so I was writing the book as everything was happening. But of course, then I did not know it was a book. I was doing this because this was a way for me to voice what was happening, for me to also hold on to this very flawed idea that I was still myself if I was still producing words. And I had no intention of publishing those words, but I felt because I had to limit so much of my daily life in a way that I had not done before. So I worked the minimum amount of hours I could while still affording to exist. And so I really needed something to fill the days and particularly fill that awful space after an appointment or a particularly um, upsetting episode of illness where you are alone and often for me in terms of the medical profession uh, contact filled with frustration and really rage. So I found the page, a place to express that. And it was not until quite a bit later that I realized it could be a book and that I would feel comfortable with it being out in the world and read. Was there a particular turning point for you when you realized you had something that felt literary, that felt poetic? Or did it just sort of emerge? Um, it's actually quite funny because each of the passages that were written at the time, so all of the memoir sections of the book were not edited much. It was the research that was shaped in the editorial process. So I think it always had that same voice because I'm not sure I know how to write uh, differently but it was not a book until, I think the first time I realized it was a book was when I exported it as a file onto my iPad and I read the PDF on iBooks and I was like, this looks like the shape of a book, which is funny because the physicality of objects can really allow us to shape and define what we produce. So when I received my box of little hysteria copies in the mail, that somehow felt less real than it looking book-shaped on my iPad. 
it almost seemed um, ridiculous to have my name on a book cover. I was like, this is some elaborate joke. That's lovely. <laughs> when, when you do start to research this and you start to look into it further, as a way of first of coping, you discover this kind of legacy that you belong to, a sort of sorority of suffering in a sense. Now, when you found your experience echoed, in these stories of these women, when did you decide you wanted to tell those stories? I love the phrasing of sorority of suffering. Um, I think of them as my ancestors to a kind of community that I feel so privileged to belong to of these women who really leverage their own circumstances and advocated for themselves to receive the best type of care that was available and who often pushed back against really, I suppose, difficult um, authority figures who had the power to punish them. One of the women I write about, Blanche Whitman, um, she tore her bed sheets in frustration one day and the neurologist who she was in care of decided as a result that she would be put in the asylum part of the Sao Patria hospital instead of the hysteria wing and the hysteria wing allowed much more flexibility she was allowed to go outside and move according to how she wished to and in the asylum, it was a cell. Yet she still tore those bed sheets and she still expressed her frustration. I really admire that kind of movement and will within these women. It allowed me to see myself within the line of this history, it allowed me to think maybe I possess this strength too. And maybe I come from a history that lets me speak and is something I really want to belong to. A lot of the ways we view severe mental illness, I think it's the opposite. We don't see it as a place of belonging. We see it as isolation and strangeness. So to be connected and strong felt like something really incredible. I'm not sure that answered the question at all. <laughs> no, but you show such a kinship with them, which mm. is which really comes across in this idea that we aren't alone when we suffer and it's so easy to feel like we are so alone. I think that's one of the things that's so engaging about reading this is that you do feel like there's a community of people that are waiting for you whose stories hasn't necessarily been told. Is there mm -hmm. one woman in particular whose story spoke to you in a, in a particular way who, who helped you see yourself differently or whose story you particularly wanted to share? I think all of the women in their own ways reflected a certain part of me, which is interesting. I think I have a friend who says memoir, people read memoir because it is a refraction of the self. And I think that's also true of searching for me, for women with mental illness within the archives, I could see parts of myself and my own experience. I think I'm most connected to Katharina because our names are the same. Uh, they're both derived from the same. Um, I guess name and so she was particularly compelling to me as well because she had the smallest pieces I could kind of wade through she was only written about once by Freud in uh, his case studies book studies on hysteria she was not a recurring patient of his she found him on a mountaintop while he was on holiday and she presented her own experience uh, to him and the power of that 
she was 18 years old and she saw that he'd written his name in a logbook. And so she thought, I'm going to tell him exactly what's happening to me and I'm going to find answers is something I hold particularly dear because as a part of my illness, but I think as a part of my personality, I'm quite insular. So to have that fierceness and that sense of importance of the self and the, to demand answers from Freud, I think is something incredibly moving. Yeah, she's a particularly magnificent story inside of this book. Mm. Now, one of the through lines of your book, other than the stories of the women, is language and what it does to both open things up for us, the power of a diagnosis or the, the disappointment of a, of a lack of diagnosis or the power it has to kind of cage us or lock us into things. And there is no more weighted term than the term you chose to call your book which is hysteria, if there is a word that is more weighted for women, that is sort of has this baggage of, of cruelty and misunderstanding and willful devaluement, it is hysteria. And yet you claim it as the title of the book. Is it a provocation is, or is it a sense of ownership? Why, why use it? Well, I remember the exact moment actually that the term came into my life personally I was on the bus home from seeing a psychiatrist and spending too much money on said psychiatrist which I think is true of all psychiatrists actually they're incredibly um, prohibitively expensive but she had said what I was experiencing was probably what she called pseudo seizures which I now understand is a very outdated term for non-epileptic seizures. And so naturally I was on the bus Googling what that meant. And it took me within the first Google to realize that pseudo seizures or non-epileptic seizures would once have been called hysteria. And realizing that somebody has just diagnosed you with hysteria while on a Adelaide bus moving through the suburbs was a very strange experience. And I decided when I was looking at what this term meant and who'd encountered this term in a personal way that while it is gendered and while it has created a lot of confinement and suffering for people, it would be unfair to forget it, not only because it affects how women with mental illness are being treated now, but because to forget that term means to forget the women who were associated with it and who built incredible lives with this illness. So I really wanted to remember the women who were around it and not the men who diagnosed it and named it. That's wonderful. There's this ex um, extraordinary scene in Hysteria where you're talking to your dad as you're waiting for test results. And he says, you, I think, are the kind of person who sees a lot in the world, but maybe you see too much. And he likens you to Virginia Woolf. It becomes too painful for you to see. Virginia Woolf was one of those authors who very early on helped shape the way we think about the mind through her writing. How did the process of writing this book help reconcile you and your illness as a kind of literary endeavour or the sense of self? How did it sort of emerge through the process of writing? Mm. I think having done publicity for the book, as a quick aside and having that conversation with dad brought up again, it made me realize how important touchstones are for people with mental illness. If he had not, he may not have had the language to express some parts of my illness, but he could refer to Virginia Woolf. So I think 
writing and voicing our own experience is so important in being able to communicate it with one another. And that's really impacted me after the book. Um, so I think that's just really interesting too. And now I've forgotten the beginning of your question, sorry. Well, how did, how did the process of writing for you help you make sense of it? Yeah, um, I think for lots of writers, writing is how they think. And I was writing, but I was also reading a lot. And I was feeling very frustrated with what I was coming across because when you start looking into illness and disability, you invariably come across a lot of medical studies. And when you are the person experiencing illness, you are presented with very dehumanizing portraits of people who could very easily be you. So turning to literature and particularly Siri Huspert's The Shaking Woman was really important and fundamental for me, allowed me to see representations of women that acknowledge people as nuanced and not stripped down to the core symptoms and the ability to cooperate within the study or not. And I think at the end of the day, seeing those stories represented and seeing myself in them and not in them allowed me to process a lot of things I was going through more than studies or medical literature. So that's one of the things I love most about your book is that it's, in, it's not a static document. Um, it's meaning, the meaning of the book itself changes over time as you understand more about yourself and your illness, the, what the book can do or must do or can't do sort of necessarily changes over time. About halfway through your book, you write, I think I began writing this book to make sense of what was happening, to understand what it means when your mind unfurls and twists itself into knots you can no longer recognize. Along the way, I had hoped that understanding would illuminate a path to health, but the more I learn about the complexities and the lack of knowledge around conversion, the more my hope dwindles. So it's like the raison d'etre of the book halfway through crumbles and it has to become something else. Can you tell us sort of a two part question? How did what the book was doing change over the course of the book itself? And now it's out in the world. How has that changed again for you now that it doesn't belong to you anymore and readers are responding to it? Yeah, so for the first part of the question, I think it's interesting because you don't know what you're writing until you reach the end. And I think that's true of all writing. But when you're working within memoir and you're experiencing as you're creating, it, it allows you to see some things and reflect on your own life in a way that is illuminating. I think, I think as I write in the book that the book really interrogated my own idea of internalised ableism about what being unwell meant and interrogated the idea that illness was something to be recovered from. And so many of the barriers I was facing was not of my own creation, but was structurally how we as a society, at least in you know, the Western world, view illnesses uh, something to be recovered from, a narrative arc, and also something to be feared, especially with mental illness too. So a lot of the work the book is doing was my own work of unpacking that internalised ableism of what illness is and also how what worth 
is for a person when it comes to what they can produce that late capitalist idea of somebody's worth is what is monetary. So having to really place barriers on my own life about what I can achieve to look after my health was something I was not prepared to do at the beginning of the book. But by the end, I was seeing the beauty in that and how I think, although we, I believe we'll all be touched by illness and disability in our lifetimes, I think we have so much collectively to learn from the disabled community and the chronically ill community because they have such a great way to manage life and prioritize meaning within life. And for the second part of that question, it's strange because I think once you write a memoir, you hand it over to the world and it's no longer yours. I see the book as an archive of my experiences and the women whose experiences have affected me. But at the same time, the other day I looked at one part of the book that recounted a scene in my life and I could not remember it. Like it was completely gone from my memory. So this part of me in some ways is more alive in recent readers' minds than my own. So I wonder how much I can own it anymore. And I like to think it's out there doing what it needs to do at least. What would you hope that it does for women who read it, for anyone who reads it? I would hope that it would really, this is, sounds overly simplistic, but I think when you are unwell, it's incredibly important. I hope it would allow people who live with similar symptoms to feel seen because that is something I could not feel as I was searching and reading. And when there were glimmers of me seeing that, that was what I held dear. So I'd want it to just allow people to feel like they are not alone, particularly when it comes to severe mental illness that has symptoms that are uncomfortable and are subject to a lot of stigma. So for example, uh, experiences like psychosis, I would really like those people to be able to hold this book dear. What is next for you? What do you do after you write a book that's so personal? So I, I think it's probably a good thing I don't have the luxury to take a break. Um, because I'm working on my PhD at the moment, which is within creative writing. So I am working on a book that is both very similar to this and very different. It is a hybrid memoir and biography around a forgotten woman, but it is not about mental illness. It is about the first woman clown, as in circus clown, Fantastic. <laughs> that is a complete sort of 90 degree turn, or is it? Exactly. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it's also uh, tragic too. It's, I guess that's what clowns are, right? <laughs> is this a good time, Emma Kate, to turn over to our questions from readers? Yes, yeah, I think that it is. We've had a couple of comments, so I'll start reading. Um, I'll start with reading those out for you, Katerina. So um, Shulin has said, hi, Katerina. I'm a medical doctor who shares your aversion to the, dehuman to the dehumanizing language and categorization in psychiatry. Don't worry, there are heaps of us out there. And I actually came across your book in, a, in one of our feminist doctors Facebook groups and a medical mum's book club. 
your book was being posted and referenced by lots of my colleagues and I'll definitely be recommending it to patients for functional physical illness, e.g. ME as well. It's beautifully written and so brave. Well done. Have a great Christmas with your lovely family. Um, Anne has also written a comment and followed it on with a question. Um, Anne says, my daughter has non-epileptic seizures and your story felt familiar. The spaciness, the epilepsy medications, for her, it was amazing to feel visible. She's also compiling the journaling, which is so helpful, which may become a contribution in this space one day. Thank you for sharing. And Anne followed up saying, um, we managed to get a good team and a diagnosis, but we, could have ha but we could have missed it. I wonder if Katerina has any thoughts on how the system response can improve to help people navigating a chronic illness. Wow, um, thank you both for those uh, incredible comments. I think I will be holding them very dear in the years to come and reflecting on them in those moments where we wonder why we do what we do. So sincerely, thank you. I think, and that is so true about missing diagnosis, especially with non-epileptic seizures. I read that it was maybe even a third of all patients who present to an ER with what they believe is epileptic seizures are actually non-epileptic seizures. And I think it is very common for the medical profession to miss diagnoses of illness when said illnesses exist kind of in between or overlapping spaces of different areas of medicine. So for me, psychiatry and neurology, and that too affects treatment. I met somebody with non-epileptic seizures who was being treated by a neurologist while I was being treated by a psychiatrist at the time. And obviously that greatly affected our care. So I think it's so important that we move towards a holistic view of medicine where not only is there time for the patient to express what is happening within the appointment and for them to feel listened to, but then for medical teams to communicate with one another. And I think that's so difficult because that is so expensive. And because it's expensive, people who have the power to make change around funding do not wish to put money into people who are unwell, which is grossly unjust, of course. So it's very difficult. But within that, I think in my own experience, just online, as well as looking back at history, the community we have, the disabled and chronically ill community is so powerful and the families within that are so powerful that we have achieved so much and will continue to achieve so much. So hopefully in the coming years, people will not experience the hardships that many of us have experienced. Thank you. Thanks for that answer. Um, we've had a question. Um, Katie has asked a couple and I'm going to read them both out. But the first is, um, can you tell us more about the clown and how <laughs> tragedy are two sides of the same story? I could talk about clowns for um, so long. One of my favourite quotes uh, recently is, I discovered is that the clown is always a stranger which I think is so interesting because it's so true. Um, and I think within comedy, there was always that sense of not being able to touch who that person is. So the woman I'm researching was thought to be the first woman clown in America, although that's a little bit contested. And her life was so dynamic she married 
a clown who she met at the circus and she decided that because she didn't want to stay at home while he traveled throughout America that she would clown as well but she was active from the 20s to the 60s so in the 20s where circus in America was at its peak she could not perform as she was a woman um, she had to perform as a man as a clown so I think that's so interesting the many different layers she had to embody on stage and the physicalities of clowning too at that time were really interesting but for me there's so much joy in her life in her performance and her love of performance but the tragedy was that she worked until she was very old she lived in absolute poverty after her husband died and died in obscurity she trained dogs as a part of her act and in her final year she said those dogs were her carers so I think this story embodies a lot of joy of the freedom of movement that she was allowed through performing as a man as a clown but also the tragedy of the real ramifications for aging women and poverty, especially in America. But obviously that is still a huge problem in Australia too. So lots of different things to explore that I'm deeply enjoying. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Katie also um, asked uh, she said you mentioned society has a lot to learn from people with disabilities and she asked how can people living with complex mental illnesses um, be made to feel more supported and welcomed in the workplace? That's a wonderful question. Um, I think there are a few things I would say. I think first of all it's important to really define what we see when we think of mental illness and categorize it. So what I'm really trying to say is it has been incredible how we have moved into a place as a society where living with anxiety and depression is much more welcoming and uh, we are able to express that more than we have ever before but the stigma of living with a complex and severe mental illness like my own and mental illness like schizophrenia or psychosis is so profoundly stigmatized so I think it's important to note that not all mental illnesses are treated the same and within that disclosure has very different risks for the individual. So I think on that note, once thinking that through, it's for myself and a lot of people I've noticed within the chronically ill disabled community have found that during the pandemic, a lot of um, circumstances access requirements have become available that have never been available before so something like working from home um, being able to create your own hours as a consequence of that telehealth so all of those things that have come about due to COVID I think it's really important to hold on to them and hold on to that sense of flexibility within the workplace and to allow an individual to feel like they can talk about it, but to also respect the boundaries that may be placed on top of that. I hope that answered the question well. It does, thank you. 
Um, so I have a question that I'd like to ask, if that's okay. I'm going to yeah. ask um, the audience to, to send through um, any last ones that they have, because otherwise I'll hand back to BJ and Katerina for final comments. But um, I wanted to just ask about, um, you've talked about uh, the, the sort of, diffi not difficulty, but how writing about this is clearly very personal. Um, and I wanted to ask you how you become comfortable um, once that story is out there in the world, knowing that it's being read, how you sort of cope with the idea of it being um, read and not, not necessarily um, received in the way that you intended. Does that make sense? I, I'm, I'm a writer myself and I'm writing about something personal. I'm really struggling with the idea of it being out in the world and, um, and not having control over it anymore. So I'm wondering if um, if you could talk a little bit about that, given that it's such a yeah, such an important topic. Makes so much sense. Like, yes. <laughs> um, so for me, when I was working on the book, it helped that I didn't think it was ever going to be published. And now, when I write, I try to reconstruct that mentality because my process is to write everything down and then I can go back as a part of the editorial process and remove what I feel uncomfortable with or as I show um, my family what they may feel uncomfortable with. So part of the process of finding that sense of comfort has been allowing myself to fully express everything and then remove anything later. Unfortunately, I never do remove anything because once it's complete on the page, it feels like a complete expression to me, but I still know that I could hold things back if I wish to. Once though something is within the public realm, especially something that discusses trauma and mental illness, it's really difficult to know that this can very easily be Googled about you. It's such a disclosure and that people have this really personal insight into your life. And that has resulted in a few people disclosing to me, which has been such a privilege to be able through my words for people to feel comfortable to talk to me about things they may not have talked to anyone about. So that has really allowed me to kind of push forward uh, to hear when it means something to someone allows me to push against those moments of discomfort. But also I think the process of writing a memoir like this was one thing and then publishing it was a whole nother thing that I was not anticipating. And so many people say grief comes in waves and I see that within myself when it comes to accepting my own illness and accepting that this book is out in the world. Not the sense of grief, um, but rather the sense of comfort and discomfort and frustration and joy all comes in waves. And that's a wonderful part of the process, if a difficult one. Thank you so much. Thanks for that answer. Do we have um, any more questions or can I steal no, Katerina? we don't. So, yeah, you can steal Katerina. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. We haven't got any more, but, yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'll end on one last question, Katerina, which is one of my favourite tiny scenes in the book is that you're playing a board game with your family <laughs> and you kind of zone out and then they all start teasing you about the fact that you have seizures and it becomes part of the kind of family lexicon of joy. And... I really love that scene because it was just, it was just, you know, ordinary people teasing each other about ordinary things. And what I wanted to ask you is we have so much 
such a sense that having an illness is a dour, dreary, wrenching kind of thing. How important is it for us to have a literature of the joy that an illness brings in terms of its change in perspectives and its change in community? How important is that, do you think, to, to portray on the page? Thank you for that question, BJ, because that is one of my favourite parts of the book too, actually. I really wanted to portray that illness is not always or just not ever a tragedy. I think to be a person is to exist with many conflicting ideas at the same time, and that is true of illness. It is so many different things and a part of it is a big joke too and I think you know chronically ill and disabled folks have such to make a general generalization have such great senses of humor because the ability to laugh at yourself and laugh with your family is for me it feels like the ultimate acceptance especially when it comes to mental illness. And of course, um, there is, you know, specifics when, within this, it's never about punching down. But um, to laugh about something, I think means you don't fear it. So if my family sits with me and has a joke about how I messed up my Cluedo move because of my experience of illness, it means there is no fear there, there is no disgust there. And I think that is perhaps the greatest fear of people living with severe mental illness is to be seen that way. And I have been seen that way by some people, but not by my family and not in that moment. And that really epitomized joy for me. So hopefully I become one of the representations of illness that is dynamic and I think, too, this is why I love uh, people like Maria Bamford and Aparna Nanchala, who are comedians who talk about their mental illness, because it's so important to show all the different dynamics of existing within a body that is not seen as the norm. Thank you so much, Katharina. And I know I speak for everyone who's listened today when I say thank you for your honesty and your candor and your compassion and your empathy and for telling the stories of these remarkable women that would not have been told otherwise, for saving them from the more of historical forgetting. So the book <laughs> is Hysteria and I cannot recommend it in high enough terms. Thank you so much. Thanks, BJ. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming and for listening today. Yeah, thank you, BJ. Thank you, Katarina. That was such a wonderful conversation. We've had plenty of comments, which I've read out, and a couple of extra ones that have come through, which I'll pass on now, because unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, thank you all so much for attending. Um, I've posted the link that you can use to grab your copies of Hysteria in the chat box once again. We really appreciate your support, and we hope that you continue to um, that you pick up your copies and you continue to enjoy our online events with us. So thanks again, BJ and Katerina, and have a lovely night, everybody. Good night. Good night.